In a previous lecture, we distinguished between discrete and continuous random variables, and then we concentrated on discrete variables and probability distributions. In this lecture, we will again look at the differences between discrete and continuous random variables, and then we will look at continuous variables and density functions in more detail. So first of all, for a discrete var random variable, it assumes a finite number of possible values or a countably infinite number of possible values. A continuous random variable assumes a value within an interval, so it assumes an uncountable infinite number of possible values. For a discrete random variable, it typically involves counting. If you think back of the binomial distribution, for example, we counted the number of successes in a fixed number of trials. A continuous random variable typically involves measuring. For discrete random variables, we associate the probability with the individual values. For continuous random variables, the probability that a random variable will assume a specific value is zero. We can only associate the probability with an interval. Now let's look at this example. Consider the duration of incoming telephone calls at the reception of a primary school. On a given day, the school received 20 incoming calls. And we define our random variable x as the telephone call duration in minutes. We can now set up the relative frequency histogram and polygon for this example. The heights of the bars are scaled down so that the total area under the histogram is equal to 1. On this slide I have a similar situation where my sample size is 20 and my bin size is 5. So what happens if I decrease my bin size and at the same time increase my sample size? Okay, so for a bigger n and a smaller bin size, we can see that the polygon starts to approach a smooth curve. We can increase the sample size even further and decrease the bin size more. Okay, now with a n of almost 44,000 and a bin size of 0.5, we can see that the polygon is now approaching a smooth curve. So when the sample size increases and the class width reduces, the relative frequency polygon approaches a smooth curve. Now this smooth curve is called the probability density function, f of x. And the probability density function is a function whose graph approximates the relative frequency polygon of the population. This graph is also adjusted to have a total area of 1. So for a function to be a valid probability density function, the function must always be non-negative and the total area under the curve of this function must be equal to 1. So remember that the density function f of x is not a probability. So f of x is not the same as the probability that my random variable x takes on a specific value, like for the discrete probability distribution. And then also the probability that a continuous random variable will take on a specific value is equal to zero. So we can only find the probability that my continuous random variable falls within an interval. And this probability is given by the area under the graph of my density function between the limits a and b. So if you know calculus, this probability will be the integral from a to b of my density function. Okay, and again, um, for those of you who are interested in calculus, 
uh, we are not going to do this in any more detail, but we can also find the expected value and the variance of a continuous random variable. You remember that the expected value for a discrete random variable was given by the sum of x times probability distribution and the variance was given by that formula. So for a continuous random variable x with a density function f of x, the expected value of x is the integral of x times the density function. And the variance is the integral of the square of x minus the mean times the density function. So we substitute the summation in the discrete probability distribution we substitute it with integrals, but we are not going to go into any further detail at this stage.